I just start this recording again? So there's two types of, again, spatial embedding within any logic. The first is continuous embedding. People are assumed to be located at a precise point in space, and there's no interaction with pay passing agents. The assumption is they're very small compared to the landscape, so they can pass each other without colliding just because they're within the same point in space. You can put in logic to, to implement collisions and so on, but they're not enforced by the nature of the space. Okay? Um, and we've seen actually this to some degree by the phenomena we just saw with immigration people being added to the population. And we didn't really concern ourselves with whether people overlapped. The, the counter option, the other option is discrete cells. So here space is divided, it's tessellated into a set of cells that are square and they're collectively exhausted and mutually exclusive. So you're either in one cell or another cell you're in some cell on the whole space, and the cells don't overlap at all. They're totally disjoint cells, but they collectively fill the space. Okay, um, Okay, and, and we'll see there's a bunch of, of built-in um, built uh, examples, at least one of which you've seen, predator prey, which divides the space up in this way. So here we're dividing space into columns and rows, and there's physical exclusion. Only one agent is alive in a given cell at a given time. So a cell, their inhabitation of the cell is assumed to mean that another agent cannot be in the cell. And in all cases, it's the environment which sets the characteristics of these, okay? Um, so um, I'd like now to go and, um, and talk, okay, so we saw a, a spatial embedding here. Okay, um, right, so, so I should emphasize in a continuous space, we only specify the width and the height of the space. In a discrete space, we specify width, height, columns, and rows. The width and space have to do with the sort of pixel area and so on, and in theory location, but you're in a particular set of columns and rows which define the grid on which uh, agents are, are distributed. Okay, I guess we'll go to this one. Um, so I'd like you to load in the game of life. How many people have played the game of life before? Yeah, okay. Um, at one point, I was told that this was responsible for more CPU hours historically than any other application ever run um, because people got quite addicted. And I have to confess that in my youth, I, um, I created uh, a number of frameworks for this, some of them written in assembly language, which ran wicked fast. and. Uh, Spent, spent quite a lot of time interacting with, um, with, uh, uh, with, with this sort of uh, set of rules, which are quite intriguing. The game is of particular interest because it's computationally universal. So if we go to examples, so I, I called up help example models, and if you scroll down, I think it's right here, uh, the game of life, yes, boom. Um, uh, okay, so there we are, um, the game of life. And let's go run the game of life. So, oh sorry, we right click on simulation and do run. So this is, um, this is what's called a cellular automaton. It's a, it's a um, agent-based model that's mapped onto a discrete set of cells with discrete time stepping it and each cell is either alive or dead. And in fact, you can read the rules here. So cells are dichotomous. They're either alive or they're dead, so they're unoccupied or, or alive. And a live cell with fewer than two neighbors dies from lack of support. It needs a certain number of neighbors alive. So if it only has one or zero, it dies. A live cell with more than three neighbors dies of crowding. It can't be surrounded by by more than three. It can't be surrounded entirely by cells. And what, when I say surrounded, I mean north, south, east, and west. Any dead cell with exactly three neighbors comes to life, and any alive cell with two or three alive neighbors stays alive. So in other words, if there's an empty cell, it will become colonized if it has exactly three neighbors that are already alive. Any alive cell with two or three neighbors just stays alive, okay? And you can click on a cell to, to, um, to toggle it, see. So each cell here 
is evolving according to these rules. And what you'll see is some um, classic patterns here. So uh, people back in the 70s, I think this, was, this game was invented, I think, in the early was in the 50s or 60s by uh, Conway, uh, a British mathematician. And um, he studied this uh, as, as an interesting example of computation. So a, uh, a system, if you consider the system extending out to infinity, a system like this can actually do all the computation that's done on any computer in the world. It's computation universal. It's equivalent functionally to a Turing machine, which can, which can compute arbitrary algorithms. And people have built computers out of these logic elements just to prove it can be done. Uh, to prove how you build a, a computer up. Now there's certain of these um, of these structures that you'll see appearing here that are stable. Like this is the structure of stable and, and these things have various names which I don't remember. This is a stoplight. I don't remember what this is called. Does anyone remember? Um, this or this guy. These, these each have certain names that people have given to it over the years. And by clicking on this you can create your own little maps in the game of life. Now you might want to slow this down s while, you, um, while you do that so that you can um, click multiple cells without it, it oh come on um, you know I've just created now a stoplight but I'm, I'm going on and creating some additional components okay now I can speed this up again and oh look that oh yeah, you, you can see some of these things are more stable than others. And I can perturb these existing ones. Look at that. I just turned it, I promoted it into a, a more advanced. So um, I set off some chain reactions there. See that? Um, so this evolves according to this very simple physics. It's a, it's a cellular automaton which evolves into, you know, according to these well, very well-defined rules. And the rules are all encoded as you might expect in any logic, the fundamental agent is a cell and it keeps track of whether it's alive or dead. I think this is poor naming convention. It should be is alive. And it's either, you know, initially it's random true, 10% chance of being true. It keeps track of who its neighbors are just so it doesn't have to ask for them every time and the number of, of neighbors that are alive around it. This is, as I said, discrete space. Why is it discrete space? Well, we're divided up into these cells. A cell is only occupied by one, at most one thing at a time. It's discrete time because these things are, are playing out in steps, step by step by step, okay? Um, rather than in a, in a continuous form. Um, but it is, um, it is a form of agent-based model. It's a particularly simple form that originated early on. And von Neumann, for those for whom that name has significance, uh, a um, incredibly prolific mathematician who lived uh, in the middle of the last century and was instrumental in a lot of early computer advances, worked with this as a model of computation as well. He was quite interested in, in these sort of distributed models. So this is one sort of model with spatial embedding within it. Let's take a look at another sort just in passing here. So I'd like you to go to help example models. And if you go down to, um, to the elephants, um, so um, let's go figure out where this is. Uh, pardon me, I just have to, um, it's a game of life. Um, we'll come back to that, but where are, where, this is actually in mobility. Um, okay, so uh, I think it's in social and ecodynamics probably. Um, population, predator, prey, um, trend, so, segregation. Ah, here we are, wandering elephants. Boom, maybe it was in that initial list. I got it under social and ecodynamics. For wandering, wandering elephants, what I've got is a very different situation. I have a continuous space, although there's some discrete elements imposed atop it. And then I have these elephants that, um, uh, that circulate within those space. And those elephants uh, end up impacting the vegetation. So you'll see uh, there's regions distinguished by altitude, and the altitude imposes some constraints on vegetation. And the vegetation gets eaten by these elephants. 
And the elephants are somewhat stylized in their depictions. The, the trunk region is particularly, um, uh, particularly abstract in its uh, representation. And uh, the elephants exhibit a very simple lifestyle, which is characterized by um, uh, two urges, one to eat and one to drink water. And so when they grow thirsty, they turn red and go and head to a water source. And otherwise, they, they head and <laughs> that elephant exhibited a um, long trajectory. Um, uh, so, so they uh, otherwise they go and they wander and they, they eat vegetation. And so if we were to start this again, um, you'll notice that the vegetation initially is quite rich. It's quite verdant. Now, if we were to speed this up, we can see they eat away at the vegetation in a, in a disconcerting uh, within a disconcerting rate. Now the vegetation actually recovers, so it actually heals up. But meanwhile, they're imposing, um, you know, imposing uh, damage to the vegetation. So they're destroying the bamboo with their tusks, I guess, or something along those lines. And um, and uh, you notice that there's emergent patterns that result. They stay in the areas of these uh, these lake shores, etc., um, largely because of the water. Um, the water availability. And um, uh, in the process, they're sort of destroying the vegetation around the water, but the vegetation further up, areas of further altitude, has, has less, less of a problem. Okay, so a uh, very simple model. Here, once again, it's supported by the structure, and we have elephants with a very simple life cycle here um, between wandering and going to water. Okay. So that's, that's an example of a model with continuous, continuous space. And um, I think in this case, there's continuous time as well, because they're moving in a gradual way. And when they arrive, they wake up and, um, and um, uh, turn around and, and do something else. Um, a final model I'll just uh, show along these lines. I can't remember if I packaged it for your examples. But it's in, um, if, if anyone's interested, I'd be glad to uh, share it with them. It's in um, a student model area. And that is a model created in this class for uh, wandering. OK, so this is already open, it looks like. Um, let me go see this. Uh, oh, 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 I guess I have to close wandering elephants. So it's under student models, and it's called NDO adapted uh, CWD. So it's a chronic wasting disease model, which was led by Cheryl Waldner of the um, College of Vet Sciences here with a, a student team from computer science. And here what we have is a kind of similar, similar model, but it's for uh, deer herds. And we have deer moving within Saskatchewan. Uh, we, uh, we have the number of deer within the population shown down here. And what's notable here, and compared to the wandering elephants, is that some of these deer are infected and some are not. So there's in early stages of infection, there's some here, but it hasn't really spread appreciably. These infections spread by contact between deer or by accumulation of these prions in the landscape. So the prions are misfolded proteins that the animals carry. And when the animals die, as these carcasses have, they deposit these, uh, these prions in the landscape. So here you see the population building up. For anyone who knows about population of deer in Saskatchewan, even at a casual basis, why does this go up suddenly here? Can anyone say? Why do we have sudden increases in the population? Well, it turns out this is, oh, uh, oh OK. Um, OK, so let me go. Um, let me just go back to, to sharing this. So why would it increase suddenly, can anyone say? Well, it turns out there's certain seasonality, so there's fawning. Fawns are born at a certain time, so the population tends to go up quite quickly. And what we see here is a situation where um, the deer are, are building up prions that are deposited in the landscape, and then other deer are coming in contact with them. So the number of infected deer is rising here. And we can continue with this model. And what we'll find is that it's imposing 
um, a, a heavy toll on the population as a whole. So it's actually bringing down the population of deer and eventually I believe deer go extinct in this case. But here we have um, the deposition of prions occurring because of, of death in animals, uh, a death of animals. Here's vegetation and here's altitude. You'll notice they also built in the seasonality of Saskatchewan. So if we were to run this and uh, keep it on vegetation, oh, sorry, I should have gone here. We should have seasonal vegetation and social grouping. We didn't have social grouping this last one. But you'll notice that this vegetation is going through, well, I'll speed it up a bit. It's going through several iterations. And this is a season that you may recognize, recognize even by looking out the window. And here is spring, still a long time off from us. Um, and here's summer. Uh, and the groupings of deer are actually rather different in each of these seasons. Um, there's, there's different grouping behavior associated with fawning and associated with rut, which is when the males go chase the, the females around. Um, as this male, they, well, I don't know. Um, that one just died. died. Um, <laughs> that may have been a, something unfortunate. Um, but, uh, but you can see this sort of herd, herd behavior associated with this. Uh, this model is being extended in a, in a serious direction. But what you have here is continuous time. The deer move over in a sort of slow way over this landscape. And you have continuous space. So the deer are located at one particular point in space at a time. And there's really no physical exclusion. Uh, the deer are obviously colored by their, um, by their sort of status with respect to the Notice that the space is, is actually divided up behind here into some, um, some, some elements, but their movement is continuous over it. And um, this is actually just imposed. This, this grid pattern is just imposed for the sake of convenience representing the landscape. Um, in any case, this is a continuous time, continuous space. We'll be looking next time on Thursday at how we implement um, this sort of uh, spatially, dis spatially explicit model, whether discrete, like that game of life, or continuous, like the elephants in here, and how we implement this mobility. How do they move throughout the landscape? How do we set their speed, um, their rotation? You'll notice some deer look like they're from Australia. Um, they're, they're moving upside down. Um, but that's based on their rotation. And um, we'll see how essentially the, the logic can be achieved and how when they reach a destination, they wake up and do something like drink water or eat food or whatever, okay? So this will be for next time. Okay, so that's all. Um, one, uh, one final reminder. Um, uh, my TA asked me to, to remind people because he's finding um, that when people send their their assignments in that um, sometimes the virus uh, filter filters out certain files. So if you could send yours in a zipped file or a gzip or some sort of common uh, zip format or binary compressed format, that will prevent the um, that will prevent the virus checker from from blocking. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Send them to me. Send them to me. It's just that. He noticed some things which I didn't, which were some files which were substituted. Because apparently what happens is um, if a file is blocked, it's not that the whole message is blocked, but sometimes particular attachments are blocked, and then there's a substitute put it for them. So for example, it's a text file. And when he opened it, it was not the original, it was not an original text file, it was something saying the original attachment was blocked. So I've sent mail to some of you saying that you're going to have to um, just send in the file in a zipped form because it was blocked originally, okay? And uh, Molly had asked about a uh, problem set for this week. I think, uh, I think uh, based on the fact that the last time it included some agent-based elements, it's not going to be needed, but I'll send confirmation of that tonight probably, okay? And alas, the deer population is, has dwindled. Um, and in fact, if we... I think they're in three of them in terminal stages, unfortunately. Okay. Boom. Okay, yeah. But Spring is coming. Um, 
Okay, so uh, that's all for today, and um, we'll see if we can uh, cover more on